What's up, droids? We're going to continue the stream where we left off last. If anyone doesn't remember, we are working in the Godot game engine docs. So we're going to do your first 2D game tutorial right now. We're just going to walk through the docs. Nothing exciting yet, but we're just putting in the learning so we can hit the ground running. Okay. Actually, it's opposite in the ground running, right? Because we're taking our time, but we're building up the tools necessary to build the 2D game that we're trying to build. Okay. The 2D game that we're trying to build. All right. Let's get started. So briefly, here's what you're going to learn. Create a complete 2D game with Godot Editor. Structure a simple game project. Move the player character and change its sprite. Spawn random enemies. Count the score and more. You'll find another series about three. I'm more focused on 2D, obviously. So why start with 2D? If you're a new to game developer unfamiliar with Godot, we recommend starting with 2D. This will allow you to become comfortable with both before tackling 3D games. And there's a completed game. Prereqs, step-by-step tutorials intended for beginners who, who followed the complete getting started. Yay, we did that. Check out the first stream two days ago. All right, if you're an experienced programmer, you can find the complete demo source code here, dot of the grapes source code. We prepared some game assets you'll need to download so we can jump straight into the code. You can download them by clicking on the link. Go ahead and do that. And let's set up the project. In the short first part, we'll set up and organize the project, launch Godot and create a new project. When creating the new project, you only need to choose a valid project path. You can leave the other default settings alone. All right, let me unzip these just so we have them. All right, download the assets, did that. The archive contains the images and sounds you'll need using to, you'll be using to make the game extract the archive and move the art such fonts directories to your projects directory your project folder should look like this art and fonts okay let's do it Godo. Godo. go dot get a good day new project to uh, let's say starter 2d cool what is this render ford plus supports desktop platforms only advanced 3d graphics available can scale to large complex scenes uses rendering device backend slower rendering for simple scenes this would be mobile supports desktop plus mobile platforms less advanced 3d graphics less scalable for complex scenes a rendering device backend fast rendering for simple scenes compatible supports desktop mobile so that adds desktop oh, that desktop a web adds web intended for low end older devices. I guess we'll just do this first. You cannot save a project in the selected path. Please make a new folder or choose a new path. Create folder. Boom. Create and edit. Let's do it. Open up on my other screen. Waiting for it to load. And it crashed. No joke. Launching. Launching. Opening. Loading. And looks like it's going to load this time. Right. So let's see, do we have project folder? Yes, here. So let's see if I can drag and drop them downloaded assets. So there's font and art. I'm gonna drag both, see what happens. Looks like it worked. Go into art, beautiful. Font art icon, yep. This game is designed for portrait mode. So we need to adjust the size of the game mode, game window. Click on project, project settings to open the project settings window in the left column, open the display window tab there, set viewport width to 480. So 480 by 720, 480 by 720 in the viewport settings, which is settings, viewport, view, see if the search works. There's 2D, no, all right. Let's read the doc. It said project settings. Wah, wah. Project settings. That makes more sense. Search for view, viewports, transparent background, HDR 2D, advanced settings. Don't see the option. Oh, there we go. Localization. No, 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 no. Project settings window in the left display window. Where did I get viewport from? There it is. All right, 480 and 20. That's not 720. Cool. Also under the stretch option, set mode to canvas items and aspect to keep. This ensures that the game scales consistently on different size screens. What is canvas items? Organizing the project. In this project, we will make three independent scenes, player, mob, and HUD. 
which we will combine into the game's main scene. In a larger project, it might be useful to create folders to help the various, to hold the various scenes and their scripts. But for this relatively small game, you can save your scenes and scripts in the project's root folder identified by res one slash slash. You can see your project folders in the file system dock in the lower left corner. With the project in place, we're ready to design the player scene in the next lesson. Okay, let's do it. Creating the player scene with the project settings in place, you can start working on the player controlled character. The first scene will define the player object. One of the benefits of creating a separate player scene is that we can test it separately, even before we've created other parts of the game. To begin, we need to choose a root node for the player object. As a general rule, a scene's root node should reflect the object's desired functionality, what the object is. Click the other node button and add an area 2D node to the scene. Godot will display a warning icon next to the node in the scene tree. You can ignore it for now. We will address it later. With area 2D, we can detect objects that overlap or run into the player. Change the node's name to player. By double clicking on it, now that we've set the scene's root node, we can add additional nodes to give it more functionality. Before we add any children to the player node, we want to make sure we don't accidentally move or resize them by clicking on them. Select the node and click the icon to the right of the lock. Its tooltip says, make selected nodes children and not selectable. Save the scene, click save. For this project, we'll be following the Godot naming conventions, GD script classes, nodes use Pascal case, variables and functions use snake case, and constants use all caps. All right, let's see how much of that I read to that saves. Okay, other node area 2D, give it a name of player, save scene, lock this thing. So locked, ungroup selected node shift command, make selected node children selectable. Nope, file, save scene. Player, save. Okay, done. Spray animation. Click on the player node and add child node animated sprite 2D. The animated sprite 2D will handle the appearance of animations for our player. Notice that there is a warning symbol next to the node and animated sprite 2D requires a sprite frames resource, which is a list of animations it can display. To create one, find the sprite frames property under the animation tab and in the inspector click empty new sprite frames. Click again to open the sprite frames panel. Animated sprite 2D, sprite frames, animated, animated sprite 2D, and then it gave us a warning. A sprite frames resource must be created or set in the frames property. Frames property should be in the inspector. Let's look for frames. Where in the world are frames? Frames, frames, node script. Don't see frames, don't see frames. Where are the frames? Animation, right? Okay. Sprite frames, quick load. New sprite frames, new sprite frames. Empty, new sprite frames. Got it. Click again to open the sprite frames panel. Oh, missed that bit. Got it. On the left is a list of animations. Click the default one and rename it to walk. Then click the add animation button to create a second animation named up. Find the player images in the file system tab. They're in the art folder you unzipped earlier. Drag the two images for each animation named player gray up one, two and player gray walk one, two into the animation frame side of the panel for the corresponding animations. So up and walk add their animations. So this guy becomes walk and we make a new one called up. Then we go into art. We look for that little monkey guy. Player gray up one and two. Go in up. Not gonna let me do that. Okay, walk. Put them over here. Click on up. Up. Very intuitive. Great. The player images are a bit too large for the game window, so we need to scale them down. Click on the animated sprite 2D node and set the scale property to 0.5.5. You can find it in the inspector under the node 2D heading. Okay, it should be easy enough. Was it the player or the animated sprite? I think it was the animated sprite. Scale under transform, scale 0.5.5. Okay, just to double check, that was under transform scale node 2D. You find this way to the player, uh, click on the animated sprite 2D. Yep. Finally, add collision shape 
2D as a child of player. This will determine the player's hitbox or the bounds of its collision area. For the this character, a capsule-shaped 2D node gives the best fit. So next to shape in the inspector, click empty new capsule shape 2D. Using the two size handles, resize the shape to cover the sprite. Okay, capsule shape 2D, collision shape 2D, but collision shape 2D. And then under here, we choose capsule, new capsule shape 2D. And then we zoom in, use our other mouse here. Oops, there we go, there we go, there we go. And I gotta resize this little capsule. Maybe that way, maybe that. How about that? What do you guys think? Here or here? A little bigger or a little smaller? A little bigger, a little smaller. Let's go a little bigger. Oh, he's a little smaller, a little smaller. <laughs> when your extra player scene should look like this. Make sure to save the scene again after the change in the next part. We'll add a script to the player node to move in and animate it. Let's do that. And we'll go ahead and save too, because you better do that. Okay, all right, coding the player. In this lesson, we'll add a player movement animation and set it up to detect collisions. To do so, we need to add some functionality that we can't get from a built-in node. So we'll add a script. Click the player node and click attach script. In the script settings window, you can leave the default settings alone. Just click create. If you're creating a C sharp script or other language, select the language from the language drop down menu before hitting create. All right, as we did in the first stream, we're going to use GDScript, which is kind of like a Python language. Area 2D inherits. Okay, so they're doing this on the player. They're adding a new script. They're not giving it a name. It's just .gd. All right, well, we can do that. Script. I think I did that wrong. I'll right click, add script, attach script. How do they make a new script? Player node and click attach script. Okay, so I just attach script defaults. If this is your first time encountering GD script, please read script language before continuing. Start by declaring the member variables this object will need. Export var speed 400, how fast the player will move, var size. Yeah, well, it's fine. Let's do it. Annotation, export var size was one. What was the other one? Var size something 400 var. Speed. speed equals 400 size it's actually screen size okay using the export keyword on the first variable speed allows us to set its value in the inspector this can be handy for values that you want to be able to adjust just like a node's built-in properties click on the player node and we'll see the property now appears in the script variables section of the inspector remember if you change the value here it will override the value written in the script if you're using c sharp you need to rebuild the project assemblies whenever you want to see a new export variables on signals this build can be manually triggered your player gd script should already contain a all a ready and a process function if you didn't select the default template shown above create these functions while following this lesson the ready function is called when the node enters the scene tree which is good time to find the size of the game window so we're gonna say screen size equals get viewport rect dot size get wrecked get wrecked guys get wrecked all right it's not funny Except it is. Get rickety rickety wrecked. Get screens form dot wrecked. No, that was not it. It was like underscore get screen. Dang it. Why do I always think it's underscore? Because the functions are underscore. Get viewport wrecked. Get viewport wrecked dot size. Save. Right. Now we can use the process function to define what the player will do. Process is called every frame, so we'll use it to update elements of our game which we expect will change often. For the player, we need to do the following. Check for input. Move in the given direction. Play the appropriate animation. First, we need to check for input. Is the player pressing a key? For this game, we have four direction inputs to check. Input actions are defined in the project settings under input map. Here you can define custom events and assign different keys, mouse events, or other inputs to them. For this game, we will map the arrow keys to the four directions. Click on project, project settings to open the project settings window and click on the input map tab at the top. Type move right to the top bar and click add button to add move right. Project settings, 
input is this tab. All right, add a new action, add new action, move, right? There we go. We need to assign a key to this action. Click plus icon on the right to open the event manager window. The listening for input field should automatically be selected. Press the right key on your keyboard and the menu should look like the the this now, right? Select OK button. The right key is now associated with right movement action. Move these steps, repeat these steps to add three more mappings. Move left, up, and down. Okay, keyboard's a little weird, but that's my move right. Add another one, move left, left, move up, move down, down, no, down. Okay, physical, 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 right, left, up, down. Okay, click the close button to close the project settings. We only mapped one key for each input action, but you can map multiple keys, joystick buttons, or mouse buttons to the same input action. Very cool. You can detect whether a key is pressed using input is action pressed, which returns true if it's pressed or false if it isn't. Process velocity, vector two starts at a zero. If input action pressed, move right. Velocity X plus one left minus one down is plus one to the Y minus one to the Y for up. So right zero or right plus left negative down plus, which is weird. Oh, because it's going down. OK, yep. OK, velocity length greater than zero velocity equals the velocity normalized times the speed. OK, animated sprite 2D play. That's going to tell it to play its sprite else. Stop its sprite because you're no you have no velocity. You're not moving, right? Why would you animate? Makes sense, right? I think so. Alrighty, then let's do that. Process velocity equals vector. Zero bar velocity equals vector two dot zero rates. And then there's like this big old if if action input. Where do you check input? The screen? No. Game? No. Is it just is action? Is it input? Input dot is action. There it is. Is action pressed? And then move. We're going to do left first. Okay, and then if it is, fall into this little if. I'm going to make this bigger, guys. Okay, if it is, then you say direction or velocity equals velocity equals vector 2D. No, was it vector 2D? I think it's just equals minus 1, right? If input dot is action pressed. We'll go with right and velocity equal. All right, let's see. Plus equals. And it's velocity x. I knew I was forgetting something. Okay, all right. Yep, uh, one is minus, but you could just say plus minus one. And okay, left was second. That's why it's minus. Okay, okay, okay. We'll do this. We'll say minus and we'll get rid of this. If you want, even move this down. Didn't work. Shortcuts are different. Shortcuts are different in this editor. Cool. Then I'm going to duplicate both of these. Nope. Doesn't want me to duplicate. Sad. If it is what? Up next, down. And this one is positive. Move down. One to the Y. Minus one to the Y. Save that. All right. So you have to do this if velocity length is greater than one. Velocity equals velocity normalized times speed. Interesting that velocity has a length greater than zero. I thought it was greater than one, but why greater than one? Okay, it's zero. Okay, it makes more sense. Then we set the animation. So it's like animated sprite 2D dot play. Was it play? Do you guys remember? Who was watching? Who remembers? Dot start. I don't remember what it was. It is play. But I missed a step. Velocity equals normalized times speed. Do we have a speed? Where do we get speed? Oh yeah, that's our, our set on our property. Velocity equals cool. And this is it is dot play. Don't know why that didn't doesn't show up. Okay. Else stop. Cool. Restart by setting the velocity to zero. By default, the player should not be moving. 
Then we check each input and add or subtract from the velocity to obtain a total direction. For example, if you hold right and down at the same time, the resulting velocity vector will be 1, 1. In this case, since we're adding a horizontal and a vertical movement, the player would move faster diagonally than if it just moved horizontally. We can prevent it that if we normalize the velocity, which means we set its length to 1, then multiply by the desired speed. This means no more fa fast diagonal movement. Yeah, I was watching a video about this. It makes sense. You said it's length 1, though. If you never use vector math before or need a refresher, definitely need a refresher. You can see an explanation of vector usage in Godot at vector math. It's good to know, but won't necessarily won't be necessary for the rest of the show. Yeah, definitely need a refresher. All right. It's been so long. Let's see. Coordinate system. 2D space coordinates are defined using horizontal axis. Yep. Zero, zero is top left. Right, 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 right. Particular position in 2D space is written as a pair of values. Four, three is here. Note, if you're new to computer graphics, it might seem odd that Y axis points downwards, upwards, as you probably learned. In math class, however, is common. Most computer graphics applications. True, true, true. Any position 2D plane can be identified by a pair of numbers in this way. However, you can also think of the position 4, 3 as an offset from 0, 0, point or origin. Draw an arrow point from the origin to the points. This is a vector. A vector represents a lot of useful information as well as telling us that this point is 4, 3. We can also think of it as an angle 0, theta and a length of magnitude m. In this case, the arrow is a position vector. It did, did it denotes a position in space relative to the origin. A very important point to consider about vectors is that they only represent relative direction and magnitude. There is no concept of vector position. The following two vectors are identical. Okay, right. So that's how the movement works. Is It takes where you're currently at and it moves one, one, or one, whatever, right? And then we got to find out about normalized. We'll get there. Both vectors represent a point four units to the right and three units below some starting point. It does not matter where on the plane you draw the vector. It always represents the relative direction and magnitude. Vector operations, you can use either method X and Y coordinates or angle and magnitude to refer to a vector. But for convenience, programmers typically use the coordinate notation. For example, in Godot, the origin is the top left corner of the screen. So to place a 2D node named node 2D 400 pixels to the right and 300 pixels down, you would use the following code, vector 2, 400, 300. Godot supports both vector 2 and vector 3. For 2D and 3D usage, respectively, the same mathematical rules discussed in this article apply to both types. And wherever we link to Vector2 methods in the class reference, you can also check out the Vector3 counterparts. The individual components. Sorry, the individual components of the vector can be accessed directly by name. So you get the X, you can get the Y. When adding or subtracting two vectors, the corresponding components are added. A plus B. So 2, 5 plus 3, 1 equals 5, 6. So this guy plus this guy equals this guy. So 2, 5 plus 3, 1 is 5, 6. 3, 1 plus 2, 5 is 5, 6. Note that adding A plus B gives the same results as B plus A. Scalar multiplication. Vectors represent both direction and magnitude. A value representing only magnitude is called a scalar. Scalar use the float type in Godot. A vector can be multiplied by a scalar. So you can times it by 2, divide by 3, times by minus 2. So in this case, 2, 3 times 2 is 4, 6. Multiplying a vector by a positive scalar does not change its direction, only its magnitude. Multiplying with a negative scalar results in a vector of the opposite direction. This is how you scale a vector. Let's look at two common uses for vector addition and subtraction. Movement. A vector can represent any quantity with a magnitude and direction. Typical examples are position, velocity, acceleration, and force. In this image, the spaceship at step 1 has a position vector of 1, 3, and a velocity of 2, 1. So he's going to go over here. The velocity vector represents how far the ship moves each step. We can find the position for step 2 by adding the velocity of the current position. Position 2 equals position 1 plus its velocity. 
Velocity measures the change of position per unit of time. The new position is found by adding the velocity multiplied by the elapsed time, here assumed to be one unit, e.g. one second, to the previous position. In a typical 2D game scenario, we would have a velocity in pixels per second and multiply it by the delta parameter. Time elapsed since the previous frame from the process or physics process callbacks. Pointing toward a target, in this scenario, you have a tank that wishes to point its turret at a robot. Subtracting the tank's position from the robot's position gives the vector pointing from the tank to the robot. Okay, so you have the tank. Subtracting the tank's position from the robots. So take, what is this? Two, three, from the, and subtract three, two, three, four, five, three, five. And a vector pointing from A to B, use B minus A. Unit vectors. A vector with magnitude of one is called a unit vector. They are also sometimes referred to as direction vectors or normals. Unit vectors are helpful when you need to keep track of direction. Normalizing. Got here, got it. Got to normalizing. Normalizing a vector means reducing its length to one while preserving its direction. This is done by dividing each of its components by its magnitude. Because this is such a common operation, Godot provides a dedicated normalized method for this. A.normalize. Because normalization involves dividing by vector's length, you cannot normalize a vector of length zero. Attempting to do so would normally result in error. Or error. In GDScript though, trying to call the normalized method on a vector of length zero leaves the value untouched and avoids the error for you. So I really want to know what the output of this is. It's just not like I need to see it in my head. Okay. So X, let's see, if you pressed right, velocity X becomes one. If you're also holding down, down, Y becomes 1, so it's 1, 1. So that's a diagonal movement of 1, 1, right? If velocity length is greater than 0. If it was 0, 0, then it would be length 0. But if it's 1, 0, or 1, 1, or 0, 1, then it's greater than 0. Then you normalize the velocity. So you take a 1, 1, and you times it by its magnitude. So what's the magnitude of... It's one times one. Isn't that still one, one example? Let's divide it, equivalent. Okay, returns the result of scaling the vector to unit length, equivalent to V divided by V dot length. This function may return incorrect values if the input vector length is near zero. Returns true if the vector is normalizing its length is appropriate. Approximately equal to one. Okay. So this is not setting direction. This part is just getting speed. So uh, these are directions, move right, move left, move down, move up. But they're trying to decide how at what how many frames to move it. So they're going to multiply the direction times the speed. Makes sense. But when you're moving diagonal, you have both a move right one and a move down one. So that would normally be twice as much movement. But they divide by one, divide by the length, which is two. What does the length come out to on a, on a vector? Is a vector? Velocity. Go back. Oops, how do you go back? Velocity, what's the length on a velocity? It returns the length magnitude of this vector. Okay, so we just talked about magnitude. Magnitude. Okay, so magnitude. So we went one, one, then the magnitude is the length, which is one. Isn't it the same as going one, zero? Isn't the magnitude still one? The magnitude is the same for a diagonal or a down. Okay. So are you always divided by one in this case? Turn it to length. Okay, so we get the length. Then we normalize it, which takes the velocity, one, one, and divides by one. How do you divide one, one by one? I'm so confused. Did he add them? Did it, did it say two? Did it say somewhere that the vector's two numbers? How does this make sense? Adding vectors to it. When adding or subtracting two vectors, the corresponding ones are added. If you want a point, you subtract. All right. Normalizing a vector means reducing its length to one while preserving its direction. But that's already one. 
This is done by dividing each of its components by its magnitude because it is such a common operation. Godot provides a dedicated normalized method for this. I guess I don't understand the length. I, if the magnitude, it, magnitude is one for a diagonal movement, uh, of course, movement doesn't matter. Hmm. Oh, whatever. All right, a common use of unit vectors is to indicate normals. Normal vectors are unit vectors aligned perpendicularly to a surface defining its direction. They're commonly used for lighting, collisions, and other operations involving surfaces. For example, imagine we have a moving ball that we want to bounce off a wall or other object. So this would be the normal, this would be its, the direction it's moving, this is where it's gonna reflect. The surface normal has a value of 0 minus 1 because this is a horizontal surface. When the ball collides, we take its remaining motion, the amount left over when it hits the surface, and reflect it using the normal in Godot. There is a bounce method to handle this where here is a code example of the above diagram using a character body 2D. Collision kinematic collision, move and collide, velocity times the delta. If collision, reflect. Collision.get remainder, so this red line, call bounce. Collision.get normal to get this normal. Calling bounce on a remainder, passing a normal. It's gonna return this reflect vector. The velocity should equal the velocity.bounce collision get normal. So that's the, so I'm just trying to get the direction from where it hit. If this dot bounce takes the collision normal as well, move and collide, reflect. It's interesting. So the velocity is calculated off the current velocity. I guess you have to know how fast it's hit. It's going here to know how fast it needs to move away from there. Okay. Got it. The dot product is one of the most important concepts in vector math, but it is often misunderstood. Dot product is an operation on two vectors that returns a scalar. Unlike a vector, which contains both magnitude and direction, a scalar value has only magnitude. The formula for dot product takes two common forms. A times B equals magnitude of A, magnitude of B, cosine eta, what is that one? And A times B equals A, x b x plus a y b y the mathematical notation a represents the magnitude of vector a and a x represents the component of vector a the x component of vector a however in most cases it is easiest to use the built-in dot method note that the order of the two vectors does not matter so a dot b or b dot a the same thing the dot product is most useful when used with the unit vectors making the first formula reduced to just cosine zero cosine theta cosine whatever that is this means we can use the dot product to tell us something about the angle between two vectors so a dot b is greater than zero this cannot be a dot b is less than zero. a dot b equals zero. When using unit vectors, the result will always be between minus one, 180, and one, zero. So if this is zero, minus one is 180 from here. One is 80, uh, 180 from here. Zero, one. Got it. Basic. We can use this fact to detect whether an object is facing forward toward another object. In the diagram below, the player P is trying to avoid zombies A and B. Assuming a zombie's field of view is 180, can they see the player? That depends on its range. It is facing the player, but I don't know about the range. The green arrows FA and FB are unit vectors representing the zombies facing direct direction, and the blue semicircle represents the field of view for zombie A. We find the direction vector AP pointing to the player. Use P minus A and normalize it. However, Godot has a helper method to do this, calling direction 2. If the angle between this vector and the facing vector is less than 90, then the zombie can see the player. So you do if, so direction to P, A to P, 
Okay, gives you AP. If AP, just the direction being they're facing, if the difference between these is greater than zero, which we know to be 90 degrees, print AC is P. Cross product. Like the dot product, the cross product is an operation on two vectors. However, the result of the cross product is a vector with a direction that is perpendicular to both. Its magnitude depends on their relative angle. If two vectors are parallel, the result of their cross product will be a full will be a null vector. Cross product is calculated like this. Cx equals Ay times Bz minus A. C times B Y. With Godot, you can use the built-in vector 3 cross. Interesting. Cross product is not mathematically defined in 2D. The vector 2 dot cross method is a commonly used analog of the 3D cross product for 2D vectors. In the cross product, order matters. A dot cross B does not give the same results as B dot cross A. The resulting vectors point in opposite directions. Calculating normals. One common use of cross products is to find the surface normal of a plane or a surface in 3D space. If we have the triangle ABC, we can use vector subtraction to find two angles, AB and AC. Using the cross product AB times AC produces a vector perpendicular to both the surface normal. Here's a function to calculate a triangle's normal. Get triangle normal, ABC, find the surface normal given three vertices. Side one equals B minus A, side two equals C minus A. Normal side one dot cross side two is the normal. Okay. Pointing to a target in the dot product section above, we saw how it could be used to find the angle between two vectors. However, in 3D, this is not enough information. We also need to know what axis to rotate around. We can find that by calculating the cross product of the current facing direction and the target direction. The resulting perpendicular vector is the axis of rotation. Okay. Well, that was a nice little math lesson. Definitely more to refresh on. All right, let's move on with this game. Here we go. We start by setting the velocity to zero, zero. By default, the player should not be moving. Then we check each input and add subtract from the velocity to obtain a total direction. For example, if we hold right and down at the same time, the resulting velocity vector is one, one. In this case, since we're adding horizontal and a vertical movement, the player would move faster diagonally than if we if it just moved horizontally. We can prevent that if we normalize the velocity, which means we set the length to one, then multiply by the desired speed. This means no more diagonal movement. We also check whether the player is moving so we can call play or stop. Dollar sign is shorthand for get node. So in the code above, animated sprite 2d.play is the same as get node animated sprite 2d.play. In GD script, dollar returns the node at the relative path from the current node or returns to null if the node is not found. Since animated sprite 2D is a child of the current node, we can use animated sprite 2D. Now that we have a movement direction, we can update the player's position. We can also use clamp to prevent it from leaving the screen. Clamping a value means restricting it to a given range. Add the following to the bottom of process function. Make sure it's not indented under the else. All right, so we got there direction now we actually need to move them we know what velocity is we know how much time has passed since the previous frame so you do velocity times delta the position dot clamp vector zero screen size is to keep them in on the screen cool all right put this guy out of here here the delta parameter is the process function refers to the frame length the amount of time that the previous frame took to complete using this value ensures that your movement will remain consistent even if the frame rate changes click play scene on mac and confirm you can play the player around you can move the player around the screen in all directions. If you get an error in the debugger panel that says attempt to call a function play in base null instance on a null instance, this likely means you spelled the name for animated sprite 2D node wrong. Node names are case sensitive. Let's see what error we get. Save. Play scene. Right, so we're going to go right down. I can't hold it down. I must have used the wrong. I must have used the wrong is pressed i uh, use just press i knew we were gonna have a bu bug i knew it i had a feeling i had a feeling guys and we did we had a bug that's why we test 
Okay. How about now? Right? Ooh, down. Ooh, ooh, ooh. You can't go off screen. Cool. Very cool. And just to see what it'd be like if we didn't normalize, it should be faster diagonal. So that's diagonal versus left, right. Diagonal, way faster. Which technology? This is an open source, free to use, free to build, free to edit, free to anything game engine called Godot. It's pretty cool. Very simple. So that's why we need normalize. But to better understand this freaking math, I'm going to see if I can console log. I don't know if they have that. Oh, they have, it's called print. Print, print velocity dot the velocity first. And let's print. Oh, we can't duplicate the line, sadly. Now we'll do velocity normalize. Yeah, that guy. All right, let's try this. You can see the difference. So I need to press just one direction, right? So it's always one zero even after you normalize. Down is gonna be zero one. If I press both together, it should be one one. And then normalize comes out to 0 0.7, 0 0.7. So that you don't move two spaces instead of one total. How is that possible? Yeah, I don't understand how divide by one works here. Don't quite understand what's happening. Like, how do you get 0.7? So how's 70% uh, side and 70%? Uh, so this comes out to 140%, right? Aren't you moving faster at that point? Yeah, whatever. I'm too tired for, for math right now. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Now that the player can move, we need to change the which animation the animated sprite player sprite 2D is playing based on its direction. All right, we have the walk animation, which shows the player walking to the right. The animation should be flipped horizontally using flip H property or left for left movement. We also have the up animation, which should be flipped vertically with flip V for downward movement. Let's place this code at the end of the process. Okay, so if velocity X is not equal to zero, we want to do some flipping. So if X is not, so if you're moving in a direction left or right, you want, see the note below about Boolean assignment, flip horizontal velocity X less than one. Okay, so this will say, if it's less than one, flip it. Otherwise, don't flip it. And then you don't want to flip V at all because you're only moving sideways. Interesting. So if you're moving diagonally, then you only end up f doing the horizontal flip potentially. Okay. All right. Uh, animation. So animation equals walk and flip V. All right. Like if um, player dot X. Now what was it? Velocity dot x value of rms root mean square is 70 of the peak value or the peak value is 1.414 times rms effective value thank you i still don't get it but thank you root mean square yeah it's awesome that you know that and i used it at some point Okay. Yeah, velocity x not equal zero is what we're going for. Velocity x not equal to zero. I said not equal to zero. All right, if that's the case, then we need to do something with the animation. What do we want to do with the animation? Animated sprite 2D. Alternating between X and Y. Let's look it up. Y root mean square. It's like, what the heck are you asking me? 
is where our <laughs> MS is. is to take Gotta add the voice on. So bad. What's up, Uka? This is so bad. It's good news. A stream to flow. Here are some key reasons why RMS is important and why. Oh, that's really bad. Quantifying variability. None of these are good. provides a measure of the magnitude of a varying quantity. It's particularly useful wobble. in contexts where variations can have both positive and negative values. <laughs> it's so bad. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's really bad. All right. Uh, root mean square statistical measure used in various fields, including mathematics. Uh, the reason why RMS is important is why these quantifying variability consists of um, when normalizing uh, vectors for a uh, uh, video game characters. Diagonal movement. Normalizing vectors, vectors is crucial in video, video game development, especially when dealing with character movements such as diagonal movement. Here's why and how it is used in this context. Equal movement speed in all directions. In video games, characters typically move at a constant speed regardless of direction. Without normalization, moving in diagonally, combining two directional movements like left and up, would, would result, result in a faster, faster movement, movement than moving in a straight, straight line, just, just left or just up. This is because, because the diagonal vector is longer than the straight line vector. It's longer. Normalizing the diagonal vector ensures the character moves it. at the same speed in all directions. That answers it. Diagonal's longer. How is the diagonal longer, though? Square, is it really? Because you're going across the whole square. If my brain broke, why is it longer? Why is the diagonal longer? Isn't it still one? The diagonal being longer in the context of a square or rectangle is best understood through the Pythagorean theorem, a fundamental principle, principle in geometry. In geometry. Let's break, break it down. Pythagorean theorem. This, right angle. this theorem states that in a right-angled triangle, the no. square of the length of the hypotenuse, the side opposite the right angle, is equal to the sum of the squares of the lengths of the, the other two sides. sides. Mathematically, this is expressed as a 2 plus b2 equals c2a squared plus b squared equals c squared a2 plus b2 equals c2a squared 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 plus b2 equals c2a a squared plus B squared equals C squared. Thank you. It's coming back. All right. So if you moved at, instead of, so if you're trying to move one, one, right, that would give you a velocity of like two, we'll say. You don't want to move two. You want to move one, but you can't move just half of one and one left and half down because you're moving diagonals longer. And so that's why the diagonal ends up being uh, 0.7 whatever it was, in 0 0.707 in the horizontal and the vertical. So that you can get across that hypotenuse. Okay. It makes sense, guys. It clicked. <laughs> ah, triangles. I hate triangles. So I'm not a carpenter. All right. What were we doing here? Who remembers? Anyone remember? Anyway, Sprite, we're like going to flip it if... Something. Well, see that x is not equal to zero, then it's moving in a horizontal direction. So if it's moving in a horizontal direction, you want to play? No, you want to change it to walk instead of up. So how do I set the sprite? Is set sprite? Is that what it was? Sprite? Sprite equals? I don't remember. So sprite equals. We're going to look it up. I remember, I'm trying to do this from memory so I can actually remember this stuff. Uh, da, 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 da. It was animation, not sprite. Uh, okay. 
animation equals walk. Alrighty. Um, and then we want to set um, animation something false. We want to set animation up false. Oh, that doesn't make sense. Um, we're already moving the position. Flip. Vertical flip to false. <laughs> you just got here. Okay. Uh, so what we're talking about now is if your move your character is moving. Uh, let's see if I can play or if this is going to be broken. All right. So this is what we got. If you haven't seen this, this guy only animates in his walking animation, but we actually have another animation for when he's going up and you see his eyeballs kind of looking right. So even when I walk left, his eyeballs still right. So we want to flip him depending on if he's walking up, down, right, or left. So there's a horizontal and a vertical um, flip we can do. When we're walking right or left, we don't care about uh, flipping the up and down vertical, right? We don't care about that. We're just going to keep it horizontal no matter what. All right. So with that said, we want to turn the vertical. We want to we want to make sure we're not doing any vertical flipping. So how do you do handle the vertical flip? I don't remember. It's probably under animated dot V flip vertical. No, it's a V something V flip V probably not on the sprite. We're going to go back to the dock. Figure this out, guys. It is on the sprite. It is called flip. It's flip V. I wasn't too far off. Okay. Flip. It just doesn't autocomplete. The autocomplete sucks, apparently. False. All right. And then we do we want to calculate if we should flip horizontally. So remember, it's going to the right by default. So we only need to flip if you're going to the left. And you're going to the left if your x is negative. So we say animated sprite 2D dot flip h equals, and then we just do the Boolean math here. So um velocity dot x is less than zero i think that's right and then if oh you know what i lied before i think it's it is an if not an if else no it isn't it if else okay l if Python index. Yeah, delta x has to be negative, I think. Less than zero, x less than zero. Yep. All right, velocity y not equal to zero up. Okay, if velocity dot y is not equal. Cool, 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 cool. Animated dot animation autocompletes completely dead all right now we're going up um even if you're going down is that right oh yeah because you're gonna flip it if you're going down all right and then we don't need to set flip horizontal the false apparently because because this is an else if got it all right the only thing we have to do is the Flip for down. So flip v equals velocity dot y less than zero or greater than because I know this one's weird because you're going to be positive for going down. So I actually think this one is greater than. We'll check though. It is greater than. Cool. Let's see if that worked. Let's see if let's see if our little guy flips. Come on, dude, do a flip. All right. <laughs> looks so bad. Is that what it's supposed to look like? I can't believe that's what it's supposed to look like. Maybe, is he swimming? Oh, maybe he's like in space. 
and then going right, going left, the little eyeball. Don't have sound effects, so I'm just going to add my own diagonal. Yeah, so if you're going diagonal, it just does the horizontal, it doesn't like flip up. So what if I'm flipping up or down and then I go horizontal? Yeah, it just does th this first one. I'm curious what would have happened if we didn't do this, like if we would have just did both. You think it's going to flip back and forth or something weird? I bet it will. Let's see. Nope. But it is going down while you're walking diagonal. Okay, so they must not want you to do this. That looks weird, I guess. If you're going down, you should never... Or if you're going diagonal, you should never flip down. That's what they're trying to say. Okay, let's see. Right down. Yeah, I guess that looks better. Start out there. Then you do that. You just, like, immediately flip upwards. I guess. Oh, yeah, man, it looks neat. If it's a Pokemon-style game, you would never need that vertical flip. That's So the game I'm actually trying to make um, has a very interesting style. This is the tutorial, but let me see if I can pull it up. Cool. So the game we're trying to make, um, making it for a friend of mine, is based on a retro game, which you can play on this website. Uh, Kingdom Crusade. So my friend's an artist, and this is his concept. This is he's gonna make this a demon variant of this game that's based on uh, uh, like chess pieces, like pawns and queens and knights type characters. Uh, it's gonna instead be more, you know, gory, not gory, uh, darker themed, right? And um, the perspective is very. I don't want to say unique, but like, it's not just like, oh, it's, um, uh, top down or something. It's, it's more than that. Let's look at it. Skip ad, please. Skip ad. All right. And yeah, these graphics are dated. Obviously we're going to moderate, modernize them a bit, but we're still going to try to do some pixel art. Um, forget the controls to operate the, there we go select world select world so there's two modes this one is top down so this is the player like select but it's actually live right now the enemy so you're battling the guy in this gray area he's trying to take over your kingdom you're trying to take over his like you can see he has a guy up here in this castle so he may come over to my castle and try to steal it and I can defend. I right now have a giant in this castle. This is a wizard. This is a queen. And each of them has like different movement styles, different weapons, different health, whatever, right? Um, and so you also pick up item stuff. But this is the top down screen. This is the map select. Um, so top down. We can do this. No problem. The one I want to start with, though, is when you select your character, which I just hit X. There we go. This view, what would you call this, right? It's not, um, it's not top down. It's not platformer 2D style, right? Because you can go up and down, but then the perspective of like the tree doesn't change. I looked it up, but I forget. It's, it's also got the, a unique way of uh, moving the screen, right? Because it doesn't quite follow you if you're on the right edge of the square. Um, it just kind of static the screens not moving but then as soon as I get to like the middle point or something or far enough away from the edge it does start to move the screen see it follows the player and the player stays in the middle of the screen until you get to the edge of the, the left side of the screen right about here now the player moves and the screen does it isometric thank you that's the, that's the term I was looking for but it's not actually I don't think it's isometric. Isometric is like Diablo style, right? We can look. Maybe it is pure isometric and just being crazy. But I feel like isometric is more top down. That makes sense. Um, I guess that maybe there's different angles for isometric. Maybe it is isometric. Like I was thinking more like. Um, Diablo, let's see what comes up. Yeah, Diablo. Let's see, is that the same? Because you got a lamppost here, 
and the world doesn't change and you move. Oh my God, is it just isometric? Sort of isometric. What's the difference here? Look, at, compare the two. I mean, obviously scale and stuff's different, but like, I feel like the ground is just like completely ramped. Um, but here, I think it's just the angle. I think it's isometric at a different angle. Okay. All right. That's going to help me um, find better examples. But anyways, so it's, it's kind of unique in that regard. It has two two views that the top down one and the isometric one but also in the, the movement where the the square the screen moves or doesn't move but also it has the screen flip let me show you that so remember i'm actually in one square but they're all connected squares so if i move all the way to the left it flashes the screen and now i'm in a different square and if i try to get back to the map if i can remember what button that is no idea there. So I moved over one square. I started there and moved over here. And you can just keep moving left, move right, move up, move down. But every time you leave your square, it flashes and um, kind of loads the next one. And you start on like the, the right side of the screen because you came from the left or whatever. And so that that whole design of a map is kind of unique, I would say, or at least you're not going to find a bunch of, you know, 2d game development tutorials that have that style so we're gonna have to use our brains a little bit to come up with that movement and map and all of that but anyways we're getting ahead of ourselves we're just doing a very very basic tutorial here in um Godot. thanks for uh tuning in guys it's nice to have a <laughs> a pair even if you guys are just Faceless names in a chat. <laughs> All right, here we go. The Boolean assignments in the code above are common shorthand for program programmers since we're doing a comparison test Boolean. If you guys got any questions about this code, let me know. It's very, very, very basic stuff. Play the scene again and check that the animations are correct in each of the directions. A common mistake here is to type the names of the animations wrong. We are, no, we already handled that. It's good. Yeah, man. Well, thank you. When you're sure the movement is working correctly, add this line uh, to ready so the player will be hidden when the game starts. All right. There's also one other thing I want to fix, which has just been bugging me. And that's where he starts. He starts at the top left corner. I don't like that. So we're going to fix that. So right now our scene, what's really interesting about the Godot engine is that everything is a scene. Um, what you would normally call a prefab, like a player is just like an instance of a player class. It's actually the scene right now. So it, it's the only scene I have. So it's a little weird, but like I can run the player scene and it just puts this player model in this little rectangle. Um, and you can have scenes inside of scenes inside of scenes. Like everything is a scene. Oh, nice. How's Cody AI? I don't think I've tried that one. What is it? Use a lot of AI tools myself lately. I even looked up uh, GPT for um, for Godot, but it was pretty slow. It's easier just to read the docs. <laughs> All right, so I want to move this. You can see a little blue outline here. Um, this is a vertical screen that we set up at the beginning of the tutorial. You can't really see the left line, but it's this green one. Uh, let me move it. Let's see if I can move it. I might not be able to because it had me lock it. There we go. Okay. Had me lock the children, but I think that's fine. Because they're all nested. All right. There we go. In the middle of the screen. And then it says it wants to hide it by default. So let's go back to our script, which, funny enough, it's right here. Okay. It's going to say it doesn't actually show in the node window or whatever. And this is on ready, they said. Was it hide or hidden? Hidden equals true or hide? I think it was just like a function that said hide. Yeah. Okay. Then have you unhide? What is Cody AI? Like I've heard of it. There's been so much stuff out there. AI yeah, code assistant. With any language, 
Cody answers technical questions or writes code directly in your ID using your code graph. I wonder if, um, so I usually use JetBrains IDs and it's, I've used their code assist, which is really good actually. Code GPT, um, Copilot is good. Code fast with AI is autocomplete. Yeah, I miss Copilot uh, when I'm not in JetBrains. Cool. It, Cody is available in JetBrains. I wonder what it offers that the others don't. I know it gives you context. Oh, I know what this one is. My coworker was using this. No, but he was using it with Visual Studio Code. He was his is called something else too. I don't think it was Cody. Well, he was kind of bummed out that he had used Visual Studio Code because he's used to JetBrains. I wonder if this is, will give him what he needs. So you can add context like by adding a file. The thing about JetBrains is an assistant is you can just give it context by pasting the code. It accepts like thousands of lines of code and it just works. Uh, or you can reference the currently open file or uh, supposedly just give it a file name. But if it's not actually open, it won't have the context. It won't be able to read the file. It's kind of weird. Is all the code you're writing strictly for the character we are seeing move around like that hide function would only ever hide? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Using to start writing a collector card game. Oh, sick, man. One of the first things I ever tried to code as a kid was um, a Magic the Gathering ripoff in Visual, Visual Basic. I don't know if you guys ever heard of that, but it was like one of the first no-code platforms before no-code was a thing. But yeah, um, I didn't get very far. But uh, that was, yeah, I always liked the idea of collectibles and card games and stuff. But now, of course, Magic has an official game. Uh, yeah, so the thing that I'm programming, I specifically added this file here. It's called Player GD, which is a uh, Godot script. And that's this language here that's kind of looks like Lua or Python. I've only ever used Python, not Lua, but um, it's got some custom stuff in it, like this dollar sign symbol, which just looks up attached nodes with this name. So you'll notice under the player, I have another thing called animated sprite 2D. That's where I put the different animations. And then collision is what's going to handle. Uh, there's no visual indicator. Oh, there is a visual indicator of that. It's here. See this little guy? This is the collider. This tells it where other colliders can actually come in contact and then we'll get like an event that says they've they've hit i haven't gotten that far in the story really yet though matthew berman did a video on it but using llama code matthew berman let me check it out check that out yeah uh who was it was it um Llama's, my, uh, Llama, Llama's Facebook, right? Meta. Uh, what was the Google one? Google's talking about how they have a new coding uh, AI that they think is going to be a, a Gemini, I think. But I've been so unimpressed. I usually love Google, but I've been so unimpressed with the Google AI stuff that they've released. Uh, it's just been so far behind uh, OpenAI and Microsoft. But if it's good as they say it is like the new the new good the good models that they're not letting us hand, have yet then uh, i don't know they might take back the market we'll see berman 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 i'm watching a lot of youtube but i don't know if i've come across that guy yet i am not subscribed okay i'll check him out later Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, sometimes I do streams on different AI tools. Like I did one um, on text to speech. Yeah, text to speech, uh, different tools. Ended up using OpenAI's uh, Whisper API, which is really cool. Yeah, I've had too many side projects, man. I haven't made any progress on this game. I first was doing an Unreal Engine, and it's just like overload, too much crap. I've used. Um, I, I used some other engines in the past. Unity, obviously, which is dead in my book um, with their stupid pricing thing. And then the only real games that I've ever like finished 
almost all of them, or maybe all of them were done in Game Maker, which is so much like Godot. Like, it's so simple to use. Like, there's a lot of complexity to it once you unravel it, but it's pretty easy to, um, to get into it, I think, right? Low, low uh, jumping off point. But then... Um, Everybody started going crazy with the different pricing models. So the fact that this is open source, totally free, so it's insane. Alex Zinski. I should find the guy that uh, I usually watch for AI. Like, just like, here's the latest tool. Look what this thing can do. Zinski. <laughs> I subscribe to him as well. The problem is I think I follow like a thousand people, so I don't even know if I'd be able to find it. Subscriptions. Let's see if it just pops up in my feed real quick. Doesn't look like it. Yeah, not sure. Um, seven hours ago, major AI news, Sam Altman, AGI shocker. That later. Matt Wolf, is that the guy? You hear about really cool Four. That is a guy I'm subscribed to, Matt Wolf, uh, with the E. But that's not the one I was thinking of. I like Fireship, that guy's hilarious. Uh, if you ever watched the, those videos, web development. Yeah, well, I'll post it if I can remember. But yeah, don't see it. If I knew by asking for live development right now, that, you know, I'm so glad that I changed my freaking um, category. I had it set to Pal World, you know, that Pokemon knockoff game yesterday during my, my stream. And uh, and so then I finally changed it today. And I normally do just chatting because I never could find a uh, software development one. But then today I just searched again and somehow, yeah, software, I think it's software and game development or something like that. I don't know. Perfect one. Yeah, Fire Ship is funny. It's hilarious. Yeah, well, murdered your uh, your math's better than mine. I'm so rusty. All right, well, let's get this thing. Okay, so it's hidden by default. Where does that leave us? How do we unhide this guy? Oh, I messed up my windows. I got three monitors, and I swear Chrome is so annoying trying to find the the windows you've lost all right power world is just insane it's i would say it's the game that the pokemon company should have made when they made pokemon but it's it's too it's too too out there too crazy with the guns and stuff but just the survival mechanics are pretty addicting at least i've always liked those types of games like rust and even the lego fortnite is pretty sick like that so it's it's a good it's a good hook just that stuff alone collect it pokemon and use them to build your base like come on that's awesome all right hide preparing for collisions we want player to detect when it's hit by an enemy but we haven't made any enemies yet that's okay because we're going to use godot's signal functionality so if anyone's familiar with like observers observer pattern that's what signals are here um add the following at the top of the script if you're using gd script add it after extends area 2d using c sharp which i'm not all right signal hit this defines a custom signal called hit. We have our player emit, send out when it collides with an enemy. We'll use an area 2D to detect the collision. Select the player node and click the node tab next to the inspector tab to see the list of signals the player can emit. Notice our custom hit signal is there as well. So here, 
since our enemies are going to be rigid body 2D nodes, we want the body entered body node 2D signal. This signal will be emitted when a body contacts the player. Click connect and connect the signal. So body entered. Godot will create a function with the exact name directly in script for you. You don't need to change the default settings right now. If you're using external text editor or bug currently prevents Godot from doing so, you'll want to set your external editor, but the new function won't be there. In this case, you'll need to write the function yourself. All right, so let's go ahead and add the signal and then add body entered from area 2D. All right, I think it was up here, right? Signal hit. Save that real quick. And we'll go look at what this thing's talking about. So signals are these different, um, it's kind of like pub sub, to like a, or events. Um, where was that menu I saw it the other day? Here it is. So there's our signal, which we can tell other people who care that we've been hit but what we want is from area 2d i think area 2d they said entered area entered yeah and so what this is saying is if i just use the defaults it will add it to my code for me in this case just the function name and the property or a param that it takes it's not actually doing anything all right what do they want us to do with this body has been entered <laughs> Yeah, it'd be cool if it said, you've been bodied. Note the green icon indicating that a signal is connected to this function. Oh yeah, cool. I didn't even see that. So if I click that, it takes me here. Target player, signal, entered source player. Note the green icon indicating the signal is connected to this, to this function. This does not mean the function exists, only that the signal will attempt to connect to a function with that name. So double check that the spelling of the function matches exactly. Next, add this code to this function. So we want to hide it when you get hit. We're already hidden, but okay. And then you want to admit on our signal that we've been hit. And then we want to get our collision and set some property called disabled to true set deferred why deferred must be deferred as we can't change physics properties on the physics callback okay that makes sense so other game engines have like uh, game engines app development frameworks have like specific life cycle events that you have to do things in this one's just like i guess i mean this you would have to know that this is like a physics signal, like this function's physics related, that you can't just set this. You probably get some kind of error. We should actually test what happens if you just set it immediately instead of deferred. I'd be curious to see the error. Yeah, Red Dragon, uh, you wonder if you can with the docs at uh or put point cody at the docs let me know how that works man because um i tried that once i think i have a stream on it actually i pointed it it was a um i tried a couple times i tried like a different uh custom chat gpt plugin that reads code and like i pointed it at like a, 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 a i think it was for a cross-platform app framework kotlin or something and i pointed it at the repo and i said and I asked her questions about it, like, what do you know about this code base? And like, how would I do this in this code base? And uh, it would have to make queries to the data. It would fetch, you know, certain files. And then it would it would try to answer my questions. But it was really slow, clunky, didn't, didn't have the data it needed. So I've been working more and more with LMs. And you really need purpose-built, or at least... And, um, need access to some sort of embeddings or even a vector database of the data that you're you want to query because if you just give it access to a new website that's never seen before i've in my experience it hasn't done what i wanted to do but i'd be very interested to see how cody behaves in that regard let me know yeah, I'm, it's only a matter of time before there's like a purpose built LLM for everything, you know, so that it's like the, all these Godot docs are embedded 
in like there's like an etl that ingests them nightly or something every time they change it gets a push and the vector database gets updated or something like that you know once that stuff becomes like super easy and everyone can just do it then yeah that's basically the new google search all right each time an enemy hits the player the signal is going to be emitted we need to disable the player's collision so we don't trigger hit signal more than once so it can cause an error if it happens in the middle of the engine's collision processing using set deferred tells godot to wait to disable so it might not error if i don't use set deferred but it might okay so we're probably not gonna be able to see the error necessarily all right hide hit emits and then set deferred on the collision shape let's try it and it close this window hide One thing I missed my ID for is it moves your cursor to the outside of the parentheses for you. Hide, um, mit on hit, hit dot emit, and then, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, what was the next thing? Collision. All right. He's autocomplete because I don't remember. There we go. Collision dots. Uh, da, da, da. This is the deferred thing. Set deferred. Okay. Setting deferred. Some values false. But what value? Visible, I think. Is it visible? False. Um, let's see. Enabled false. Disabled equals false. Okay, I totally did that wrong. Oh, wait, now I'm looking at the wrong thing. It's up here. Oh, yeah, disabled true. Okay. Disabled. It, look at comma. It is interesting. Interesting. And then it's in quotes. Nope, this one's in quotes. Let's see how good this editor is. Hey, you did it. It wrapped it for me. All right, disabled is true. Cool. I know I could just copy paste it, but I want to like get it in my head. All right. Yeah, I tried running my my own. Um, are you talking about running your own model, or just in general running Cody is is hard on a Windows machine? It turns into the vacuum. Yeah. Yeah, I, I barely touch my gaming machine these days because all the cool tools are like Linux or Mac native now. So, though I hear there's some really good gaming cards that help with AI. All right, with the player working, we'll work on the enemy in the next lesson. Let's knock this out. Now it's time to make the enemies our player will have to dodge. Their behavior will not be very complex. Mobs will spawn randomly at the edge of the screen. Choose a random direction and move in a straight line. We'll create a mob scene. This is what I'm talking about. So it's like a, it's like the player object, but now it's a mob object. But they call it a scene. Uh, which we can then instance to create any number of independent mobs in the game. So it's like a prefab. Uh, note setup. Click Scene, New Scene from the top menu and add the following nodes, Rigid Body 2D, Animated Sprite 2D, Collision Shape 2D, Visible On-Screen Notifier is the only new thing. Don't know what that is. Don't forget to set the children so they can't be selected, okay? Link like you did for the player suit. Select the Bob node and set the Gravity Scale property in the Rigid Body 2D section of the inspector to zero. So no gravity because this is like floating in space game, I think. This will prevent the mob from falling downwards. In addition, under the Collision Object 2D section, just beneath the Rigid Body 2D section, expand the Collision Group and uncheck one inside of Mask property. This will ensure the mobs do not collide with each other. Why would the mask prevent that? Oh, because it's on a collision object 2D. Oh, right. So the collision object is going to collide with our player and our our collider, like our signal for hit is going to be called. But if these two collide, apparently there's, I guess mask means there's like physics on it. I'm not sure. 
yeah it, it's so simple i feel like this game engine is exactly what you would kind of think it would be i'm very impressed with it so far and then set up the anime sprite 2d like you did for the player this time we have three animations fly swim and walk there are two images for each animation in the art folder the animation speed property has to be set for each individual animation adjusted to three for all three animations oh interesting three fps okay let's see how much of this i can remember i'm going to make a new scene called mob it's going to be a rigid body 2d oh this one's a rigid body was mine a rigid body Player. What was player? It was an area 2D. Okay, that's why I didn't have to turn the mask off for the player because it was a different type. All right, rigid body has physics on it. That's why. Okay, makes sense. A rigid body 2D mob animated sprite collision shape visible on screen. And then there's some gravity scale thing that I have to turn off and mask I have to turn off. All right, I'm not going to remember all that, but rigid body 2D, rigid body 2D. New scene called mob. Oops, rigid. Rigid body 2D. And we'll call it mob. And it's under the player. It's not what I wanted. Um, oh, I know why. Because I didn't say new scene. I said new node. That before too. You will die. Bye. All right, new scene. New scene, uh, 2D scene, nope, we'll just go rigid body 2D again. Now we call you mob. All right, let's see if we can remember what we have to turn off. Oh, first we're gonna add those nodes, animated collision, what else? Animated 2D, collision. And there was something about like on, oops. I need to turn this off, cannot be selected. I gotta open this scene, unsaved, save, save, cool. And then I have to turn this guy off so I can't select the children. Now I can add a node collision shape 2D. Something about side of the screen, something notifier, screen notifier, visible on screen notifier 2D. I think that's what it was. Okay, um, rigid body, we need to turn off some stuff. Let's turn off. Gravity scale should be zero so they don't fall down. And the mask on the collision shape should be off. The mask is under visibility. Light mask, one. Visibility layer, was it light mask they said? Let's assume it was light math. Let's check. Oh, this one. Collision layer mask, not light mask. Oh, that sounded weird. There's a collision. Where is collision? Am I blind? We got transform, visibility, ordering texture material process. Am I on the wrong thing? Does this guy have collision? It is the rigid body, so I guess that makes more sense. And yeah, there we go. Uncheck the mask. I wonder, yeah, so these must be oh, like layers that you can collide with. So like if I set this to four and then I made another rigid body that's also four, they would hit each other. I don't know what's the difference between layer and mask, though. I know it can get complicated when you have a lot more objects. Okay, I think I got all that. What did I miss? All right, we gotta edit, set up the sprites for fly, swim, walk, and the speed should be three. So this, there's like an animation window down here, I think. No, where is it? How did I get there last time? Oh, I have to choose the sprite frames, new sprite frames, click it again, now it opens. We'll make this one swim because I can't remember any of the other ones. So then we got enemy swim. And we set it to three FPS. And another one for walk. Yeah, 
Oh, do I have to set this for both? Three. Like this one. Nah, good. They're both set. Okay. And then one more for fly. Oop, I definitely missed something up there. I was filtering, that's why. Delete you. Go away. Fly. Fly alt? Why is it alt? Maybe they just changed the graphics. Alright, also three. Cool. Uh, this shouldn't do anything if I play the scene, right? I'm just gonna sit there. Okay, that's what I thought. What's next? You can use play animation buttons. Oh. Button on the right of the animation speed input field to prove your animations. We'll select one of these animations randomly so that the mobs will have some variety. This time we have three animations. So fly, swim, and walk are the three variations. Okay. Uh, like the player images, these mob images need to be scaled down. Set the animated sprite 2D scale to 75. As in the player scene, add a capsule shape 2D for the collision. To align the shape of the image, you'll need to set the rotation property to 90 under transform. Okay, let's do that. Transform, rotation, 90 flipped it and uh we need the capsule where's our little capsule remember how i added that let's look at the other one layer collision object i don't even see the capsule here anymore is that our collision no Hmm. Oh, I have to. I'm gonna animate it, maybe. There we go. Sprite frame, speed, transform. No capsule. Hmm. All right. Good night, murdered. Thanks for watching, man. Good talking to you. You have to add a capsule shape 2D for the collision. How do you add it? Add capsule shape capsule. Maybe just add here. Capsule shape 2D. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I just added to the same guy that already had one. Oops. How do I delete it? I just literally create two of these. I don't even know where these things go when I create them. So if I move this, it's changing the transform. Hmm. Oh, red dragon left. Sorry. Yeah. If you, if you guys, uh, yeah man i'm all about noob i used to have a channel on youtube called noobs do it best because i just have a habit in my whole career of just like changing to new tools trying new stuff always being the noob but i don't mind i don't mind asking dumb questions looking stupid you know because i think that's the best way to learn it's awesome all right it doesn't help though that i do this when i'm freaking tired all right, animated sprite, collision capsule, add collision capsule 2D, capsule shape 2D. Okay, you're added, but this guy, like I did the other one. Oh, I realized I never changed the size. Did I lose the capsule? Oops, I'm way zoomed out. Center of the screen is over here. And yeah, it's too big. Okay. Let's fix that first then, I guess. This was scale. 
0.75 tap. Okay. Still feels big, but all right. And I'm still lost on the collision capsule. I must be missing something about this UI, like there's another tab or something right in front of my face I'm just not seeing. Let me try adding it one more time. Maybe it didn't save. 2D capsule shape used for physics collision. It's recent. I can't tell if that actually did anything. Let's increase the radius and see if we can find it. Am I blind? Is it this guy? It's not that guy. Where is this? Let's go look at the player one more time. So is the capsule on the player or is it on the animation? Or the collision? Maybe it's on the collision. Collision shape 2D. There it is. Okay. It's on shape. Ugh. Okay. You know, I see. So then we go to collision. Shape. New collision. Collision gap. Okay, so I don't know what was happening before when I kept just saying new collision gaps a little earlier. Ooh, what's the size? How do I do this? Do you have an example? Yeah, this is GD script. I might go to C sharp if I stick with this engine and want to like have reusable classes and stuff. But I think it's. I used to really hate scripting languages. I was all about object oriented programming. But now I'm just like, whatever tool gets the job done, it's cool. Not as opinionated as I used to be about those things doesn't have a screenshot of what the capsule looks like so uh is it important that the ears are touching hmm it's probably not good that it's outside the bottom like that i'm thinking we go like this like okay if you get hit by the ear nothing happens but that's better than like it touching you on the bottom where it's not even actually touching so we'll go with that Save the scene, add a script to the mob like this. Okay. This is gonna extend, or it already extend. Now let's look at the rest of the script. In ready, we play the animation, randomly choose one of the three animations. So mob types becomes uh, all of the frame, sprite frames, names, and then you play Randy, that's my name. Random mob types dot size. Ooh, a module. Mod module modulus. What do they call this? <laughs> mod. We'll call it mod. Mob types dot size. Okay, so it randomly picks one. This array of mob types. Okay. Let's copy this. I'm tired. <sighs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not metadata. I want to add a script. New scripts. Mob. This isn't ready. It's going to set up. You're going to be a random animation. Which one are you going to be? Save. Uh, <laughs> look at that guy. If I regenerate, it should be a different one, potentially. The same one. I don't know if it's got a seed. There we go. Different one. Let's keep doing some weird exercise. Cool. First, we get to list animations. Yes, yes, yes. We know, we know, we know. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The last piece is to make the mobs delete themselves when they leave the screen. Connect the screen exited signal of the visible on screen notifier 2D node to the mob and add this code. Q free. 
to free. This completes the mob scene with the player and enemies ready. In the next part, we'll bring them together in a new scene. We'll make enemies spawn randomly around the game board and move forward, move, and move forward, turning our project into a playable game. Okay, Q free, I guess. Screen exited signal on the screen exited. Okay. Does it already have that or not yet? Looks like it doesn't have it. Oh, here it is. Screen exited. Screen exited becomes... Uh, what am I supposed to connect to? Make them obsolete themselves when they leave the screen. Connect the screen exited signal to the visible on screen notifier node to the mob. Okay, mob. Just this guy, I guess. Yeah, there we go. Uh, clear queue. So, queue free, because that makes sense. Queue, such a weird word, free. Alrighty, let's connect these dots. So close. I guess we still have a HUD to do. Oh, all right. It's getting hot in here. Can you drop a link to that project tutorial when you have a second? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, you're on Twitch or YouTube? You're on YouTube? Cool, getting some YouTube traffic. Oh. All right. Uh, now it's time to break everything we did together. Create a new scene and add a node named main. The reason we are using node instead of node 2D is because this node will be a container for handling game logic. It does not require 2D functionality itself. Click the instance buttons represented by a chain icon and select your saved player scene. Okay. 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 This feels good. Finally building a real game. Scene. New scene. Not 2D scene. Uh, node. There we go. Call it main. Oh, capital or not capital? I think they don't use caps here. Well, they did. Cool. Nice. Maybe if I stream more consistent, consistently, they will show my videos in the search results. Okay, link. We're doing the link. Player. So we should get an instance of player. Nice. And now add the following nodes as children to main and name them as shown. Values are, values are in seconds. So add a mob timer, a score timer, and a start timer. How often mob spawn, increment the score every second, give a delay before starting. So you get points for staying alive, I guess. And marker 2D for start position to indicate the player's start position. All right, three timers and a, and a marker 2D. Mob timer, score timer, start timer. Score timer. Start timer. What was that other thing called? Marker? Yeah. Okay, how do we use these? Set the wait time property of each timer. Note as follows. 0.5, 1, and 2. Hmm. 
Oops. Still getting used to this keyboard. Alright. Was that point two or two? No, was, this one's one and this one's two. I think. Point five, one, two. In addition, set the one shot property of start timer to on and set position of the start position to 240 by 450. Where's the start position? Home marker 2D. I was looking at the wrong thing, that's why. 24450, something like that. Yeah. Spawning mobs. The main node will be spawning new mobs, and we want them to appear at random locations on the edge of the screen. Add a path 2D node named Mob Path as a child of main. When you select path 2D, you will see some new buttons at the top of the editor. Select the middle one, add point, and draw the path by clicking the clicking to add points at the corners shown. Do you have the points snap to the grid? Make sure use grid snap and use smart snap are both selected. These options can be found to the left of the lock button appearing as a magnet next to some dots intersecting the lines respectively. Draw the path in clockwise order or the mobs will spawn pointing outwards instead of inwards. Interesting. Okay, so where's the first dot is in this corner? When you select path 2D, you will see some new buttons at the top. Select the middle one for add point and draw the path by clicking to add points at the corners. Okay, doot, 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 doot. And we want these turned on. Okay. What am I calling this thing? Mob path. It's pretty cool. Gonna turn on magnets. Zoom in a bit. Use my other mouse. Click and drag. I wish they would make that blue easier to see. All right, add point. This one. Click. Click. Uh, I feel like that made a line. <laughs> Did I click the wrong thing? Add point. What did I do wrong? No, because they said clockwise, so I think it does have to be directional. Let's see. I guess they're just zoomed out. I don't know. Maybe this is from an older version of the... Oh, what's five? Five must be... Complete the circle? <laughs> complete the square? Select control points. Is that what he clicked? No, it's not that one. It's this one. Select points. Shift, drag, select, control points, command. Mm. That didn't look right. After placing the point four in the image, click close curve. Yeah, that's what I thought they were trying to do something like that, but that icon looks different. Where's close cur Oh, it's over here, isn't it? Where is it? This one? Boom. Done. Okay. Yes, thank you, close curve. I didn't see that. Now that the path is done... Oh, I was turning on my air and I forgot. 
room has the worst conditioning. It's either too hot or too cold. Seventy degrees. It's cooking. After placing point four, and we did that. Now that the path is defined, add a path follow 2D node as a child of mob path and name it mob spawn location. This node will automatically rotate and follow the path as it moves. So we can use it to select a random position and direction along the path. Your scene should look like this. Mob spawn location, path follow 2D. This guy. Mob spawn location. This was mob path. Okay. Let's see, does it look like that? Player, mob, timer, score, timer, score, timer, start, timer, start, position. Start, position. Position. Okay. Mob spawn location. Mob spawn location. Main script. Add a script to main at the top of the script. We use export var mob scene packed scene to allow us to choose the mob scene we want to instance. Cool. Packed scene. At exports uh, packed scene mob scene scene equals packed scene something like that sort of thing oops yes except it's not equals And then they got a score here. Click the main node and you will see the mob scene property in the inspector under script variables. You can assign the properties value in two ways. Drag mob scene from file system dock and drop it in the mob scene property. Click the down arrow next to empty and choose load. Select mob scene. Next, select the instance of the player scene under main node in the scene dock and access the node dock on the sidebar. Make sure to have the signals tab selected in the node dock. You should see a list of the signals for the player node. Find and double click the hit signal in the list or right click it and select connect. This will open the signal connection dialog. We want to make a new function named game over, which will handle what needs to happen when a game ends. Type game over in this receiver method box at the bottom of the signal connection dialog and click connect. You are aiming to have the hit signal emitted from player and handled in the main script. Add the following code to the new function as well as new game function that will set everything up for a new game. All right, let's see how much of that I remembered. Oh, first I'll have an error here. Export var mob scene pack scene export var. That'll do it. All right. And then we were. I got it. There's two things. I want to do the mob scene thing first. Right. So on this scripts. How can I set the scripts process? Mob scene, there it is. Load mob. Okay, and then player. Or oh, we want this on main, I think. No, I'd hit player signal hits. And then I want this to be on main on player hits. And then on player hits needs to do game over or something like that. And then there's like two functions. Game over. That's not that's how they name their functions. It's not ugly. And uh funk 
start game, I think it was. And then I'm pretty sure ready needs to call start game. Where are you at, murdered? What a uh, city or state or country? It's not even that hot outside where I'm at. It's still winter. <laughs> Let's see, select the instance of player under main, scene doc, X signal stand. So we did all that. Uh, this is what we're looking for. Game over, score timer dot stop, mom timer stop, score equals zero. Ohio, Ohio, Ohio. In there a couple times. Score equals zero. Score equals zero. Player start. All right, so we're getting the player, we're calling their start function, and we're passing it the position. Position is of the marker. Makes sense. And then we're starting the start timer. So get the player. Call it start function. Pass it the start marker start position. So start position dot position. Is that what it was? Oh, yep, looks like it. And then start timer. Start timer dot start. Cool. Now connect a timeout signal of each of the timer nodes, start timer, score timer, mod timer, to the main script. Start timer will start the other two timers. Score timer. Increment by score by one. All right, so on score timer timeout score plus equals one. Let's just do that first because I'm not exactly sure how to connect these. I have an idea of how to connect these. So we're gonna start timer or score timer. We'll do that one first. Timeout, put it on main, connect, score plus equals one. So what is this? Plus equals one on score timer timeout. Yep. And then the other one on start timer is where you start the mob timer and the score timer. Start the mob timer and the score timer. Start the mob timer and the score timer on the start timer. Yeah, that makes sense. Mob timer and score timer. Mob timer dot start score timer dot start makes total sense play crash start in base area 2d player dot gd invalid call non-existent start i was wondering about that i don't remember putting a start function in player that's coming up in on mob timer timeouts, we will create a mob instance, pick a random start location along with the path 2D, and set the mob in motion. The path follow 2D node will automatically rotate as it follows the path. So we will use that to select the mob's direction as well as its position. When we spawn a mob, we'll pick a random value between 150 and 250 for how fast each mob will move. It would be boring if we were moving if they were all moving at the same speed. Agreed. Note that a new instance must be added to this scene using add child. All right, um, I am going to copy this. 
because it's late, but I'm going to read it. So this was in um, on mom, mob timer timeout. So I need to do timeout, add that, and then I can paste this guy. Okay, let's read it. So, create a new instance of the you redo. Okay, create a new instance of the mob timer. I'm seeing instantiate. No, it's the first time we're seeing instantiate. Okay. Mob scene instantiate. Mob scene instantiate. Okay. This is the mob spawner guy, right? That's that's just creating an instance of one mob. Okay. Choose a random location on path 2D. So mob spawn location, mob path spawn location. Where did we get mob spawn location? Oh, that must be the four points, five points we added. Mob spawn location dot progress ratio random float. So that's how far along its progress it is. Okay, so it's putting it somewhere along the path, I guess. Set the mob's direction perpendicular to the path direction. Direction mob spawn location rotation plus pi divided by two. Direction is rotation. I'm going to leave this comment because this is confusing. Perpendicular to the path direction. Okay, cool. So if it's going, if it's on this path above, it will go down. If it's going like this, it will go left. I, I still don't know how it turns inwards. That must have been the, the clockwise thing we did. I bet you if we did like minus two, it would go outward. All right, set the mob's position to a random location. Um, spawn location. Progress ratio, random F. Add some randomness to the direction. This is the fun factor they talked about. Random F range, pi four by four. Direction. So they already said the direction, now they're plus, plus minusing some direction value. And it's a 2D vector. All right, mob rotation equals the direction. Choose the velocity. Choose the velocity for the mob velocity. It's a random uh, float range between 150 and 250 and zero. Random float range between these. Oh, and so the the second velocity is always zero. Why? Two D. So this is only going to move it in the x direction. Linear velocity, velocity dot rotated direction. Spawn the mob by adding it to the main scene. This is where the add child. So we instantiate it, but it doesn't actually show up in the scene until you add child. Okay. Cool. Pretty sure this is still going to crash. Yep. Alrighty. Why pi? Good question. Why pi? Some zoo with circles, right? At least we're not dealing with trig anymore, right? Let's see. In functions requiring angles, Godot uses radians, not degrees. Pi represents a half turn in radians. About 3.1415. There's also TAU, which is equal to 2 times pi. And you're more comfortable working with degrees. You'll need to use the degree to rad and rad to degree function to convert between the two. Fun. Let's test the scene to make sure everything is working. Add this new game call to ready. I'm still going to figure out that start function that we're missing. Uh, ready. I already did. See, I was ahead on that one. 
Let's also assign main as our main scene, the one that runs automatically when the game launches. Press the play button, select main scene when prompted if you had already set your other scene. Maybe that I did not, so let's do that. Select current scene, yes. Great, and then crash. You should be able to move the player around. Okay, so I definitely missed something. Where was the start call? Start function. The previous page must have been start. No, so where was it? Did I just make that up? Did I hallucinate? Am I an AI? Tell me I'm not crazy. Here it is. So in new game, player start. Let's just make sure I didn't typo this. New game. Did I put it in the wrong one? I put it in the wrong one. That's start game. Is there no start game? I just named it wrong. Is that what happened? Okay, score zero, start position. But that's still not why it's mad, right? Isn't it mad? Because player.start doesn't exist. So this is still going to fail, right? Yeah. Start game. Not found. Am I going insane here? Did I put this in the wrong object? Did they not tell me to add an... Oh my god. I said, I already did that. I already did that. Yeah, I already did the wrong thing. This is why you don't jump ahead. There's a lesson for you kids. Okay. Alright, start. Okay, still fails there. So let's go to player script and see what's going on with that guy. What? The scripts? Oh, I'm on the wrong thing. Okay. All right, so there's no start function. Is that right? What do we have? On area entered. Process. Ready. We just don't have start. You know how I was like, man, why is this always hidden? I feel like we skipped a step where they unhide it. Let's go back until we can find it. Coding the player. Coding the player. We're looking for start. So that's where we hit it. On body it entered. There it is. The last piece to add the function we can call to reset the player when starting a new game. Somehow missed that. Shift tab, please. Thank you. Tab. Save. Stop. Run. Moment of truth. Okay, okay. Oh, oh, guy's gonna kill me. Uh, oh, I didn't die. Okay. So the collision's not quite right, and we don't have the HUD yet. The HUD's the next part. So what's up with the collision? Oh, I did not get called. <laughs> All right. Preparing for collisions. What did I miss in here? Let's see if I got a body entered and all that set up. So if I go to main, player, does this need to have any collision set up? Disable mode? What does that mean? Disable mode. Hmm. I wonder if when I was adding all those stupid, um, what are those collision things called? Not these. Where is it? These capsules have that messed anything up. Disabled one way.
All right. So we did body entered on what script? Main or player? I think this is player, right? Yeah, we're in the player scripts. We did the hide. We have a signal for hits. And then we've got this body entered. Notice our customer. Okay, body entered. Cool. Um, hide, hit, emit. Am I missing something there? Hit, emit, set deferred, disabled, true. Hide, hit, emit, set deferred, disabled, true on the collision shape 2D. Looks right, but I mean, I've been typing and reading things wrong all night, so. Looks right, though. Start position, collision, shape 2D equals false. So it might have been disabled before. But I added that now, so that's not the problem, right? Start, disabled, false. We know the show is getting called, so it's definitely calling that. Let's add a log. Let's just add a log, right? When in doubt, print. Whatever. Hey, hit me. Okay, so they're not hitting me. So they're never entering that. I might not have hooked something up. So if we go back to main, look at our mob spawn. I guess it would be on mobs. Mob. Ready. Play. Does that have a collision? Yeah, it does. What does it look like? This guy. We turn off that mask. I don't think that's the problem. Uh, I kind of want to turn it back on. See them collide with each other. What was that? Not transform. Material process editor. This is the capsule. Local to scene path. <laughs> Physics material, collision object 2D, disable mode, remove. Collision. Yeah, we turn the mask off. Let's turn this on. I want to see if they hit each other. Let's see if we got some kind of collision. Yeah, see, they're hitting each other. So they have collision. They're not calling our function. Why? Why? That'd be. So on collision, am I missing something? What could I be missing? What could I be missing? This guy's nothing. Okay. Oops. All right, so we could add like a Collision here. I'm not going to do that though. What I'm missing. Let's look at the enemy. Maybe there's a spit. Okay, so we turn that off. Gravity's off. Animated sprite. We did all that. Rigid body 2D for the mob script. Is it a rigid body 2D? It is. So ready. Are we missing a ready? No. With mob types chooses the animation. We got that working. And then this cue free thing, which we never really understood. Uh, with the player and enemies ready in the next part, we'll bring them together in a scene. So it must be here where they collide. Spawning mobs. So we got the spawning working. That's great. Mob location, mob path, all that worked. There is that and mobs work on each other. So it's got to be the player. Yeah, totally. But um, I have this function, right? So let's walk through it. This this guy has an on area entered, right? Which is supposed to fire anytime someone enters his area. And it would call this print log, which it's not. So why aren't they hitting? Or why, why aren't they entering this little thing, right? So where does this come from? 
that on hit where's that on hit signal oh on hit signal is emitted by this but the thing that triggers this function i added it by going to node signals and then looking for area 2d or maybe it was collision object 2d maybe i did the wrong event here was it on area entered i think it was on area entered pretty sure let's go back and check on area entered on area that's the enemy player start oh i got it wrong it's the other way around it's when bodies entered how can that be you're an area why would it be a body yep thank you good call Let's see if that works Okay, still not working, but maybe it's the way I added it. Let's read that part of the doc again. So it says, Area 2D body entered. So let's get some signal uh, called hit that we will have our player emit send out when it collides with an enemy. We will use Area 2D to detect the co collision. Select the player node and click node tab next to the inspector. See the list of signals. Notice our custom hit signal is there as well. Since our enemies are going to be rigid body 2D nodes, we want body entered. Okay, so it's saying a body entered my area. Okay, I get it. The signal will be emitted when a body contacts the player. Click connect and the connect signal window appears. Godot, Godot will create a function with the exact name directly in your script. You don't need to change the default settings right now. Okay. And notice this is no longer a signal. Oh, look at the type is wrong. Okay, we're gonna do this again. We're gonna we're gonna get rid of it. And we're gonna do, we're gonna connect the signal for reals. Okay, so node collision area on body entered this one connect and now it's connected see this guy connected supposedly i don't know i don't quite understand that piece this funk come from let's see if that's all we needed these die Hey, on area entered. Cool. Do that, it'll fix it hopefully. Yep. I don't know. The only difference is I called this area instead of bodied. So like I don't understand, like, does it is it smart enough to know the difference? Like if I put this back to this, and if I just change this to body, like what's the magic here, right? Oh, that's all it needs. See? If I put the wrong word here. No, it still worked. What the heck? Save. Stop. It works. Okay, put a bad name. Save. Yeah, it, the name shouldn't matter. Maybe I forgot to save. After I change it to unbodied ender. That's the only thing that kind of makes sense. Yeah, as long as I'm not using this parameter, the name shouldn't actually matter. Okay. Either way, we know that's working, but it doesn't look like the game stops. Shouldn't the game... Maybe that's going to be in the next section. Da -da -da. Do, 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 do. Was there an end game? There was a start game or new game. Heads up display. Final piece of our game needs uh, is a user interface to display things like score and game over message. Okay, so we haven't handled game over yet. And a restart button. 
I should have told you this sooner, murdered. But if uh, if you notice a lag between you and me responding, it's because YouTube for some reason I can't find the setting for is like thirty seconds behind. But uh, Twitch is like immediate. Just FYI. And then I also send. I also like to upload um, the the stream as a VOD on YouTube, but condensed. I take out all the ums and the ahs and silences using AI and I post those up. So you'll see like past streams posted as condensed streams, which usually takes like 25 to 40% of the video away, which is kind of cool. Okay, we're going to create a new scene called Canvas Layered and it's going to be another node. No, it's uh, called HUD, and it's a canvas layer. Create a new scene called other node with a canvas layer called HUD. Canvas layer node lets you draw our UI. Um, the rest of the game so that the information it displays isn't covered up by any game elements like the player or mobs that HUD needs to display the following information score changed by score timer a message such as game over or get ready a start button to begin the game the basic note for UI elements is control to create our UI we'll use two types of control nodes label and button create the following as children of the hud node a label label button timer score label message start button message timer click on the score label and type a number into the text field in the inspector the default font for control nodes is small and doesn't scale well there's a font file included in the game assets called zolonium regular ttf to use this font do the following under theme overrides fonts choose load and select zolonium regular the font size is still too small. Increase it to 64 under theme overrides font sizes. Once you've done this with the score label, repeat the changes for the message and start button nodes. Anchors control. Nodes have a position and size, but they also have anchors. Anchors define the origin, the reference point for the edge of the node, edges in the node. Arrange the nodes as shown below. You can drag the nodes to place them manually or for more precise placement, use anchor presets. All right. So let's add this. Start with the canvas layer our other node scene and then canvas layer other node scene and then canvas layer other node scene canvas layer scene. new scene uh, other node canvas layer okay and this guy is called does it have a name control something other node. We're going to see and click other node button and add a canvas layer named. Okay, so I had it right the first time. This thing is named HUD. It's up display. And then we're going to add a label. Is there a button in there too? I know we had a label. What else do we have? It's like two or three labels and buttons. Two, uh, a button and a timer. Okay, we got a button now. And a timer. Timber. Timer. Cool. Um, let's name these score label message. Start button. Yeah, start button. It's game time. Let's see, what was it called? Message timer. Cool. And then I wanted us to do that font thing, so we should do that. Uh, An inspector. Is it for the labels? 
font, localization, focus, mouse, input. Reversibility process editor. All right, let's go back. Let's see. I click additional tags. And type a number into the text field. And the inspector the default for control nodes is small. Theme overrides. Control fonts. Theme overrides on the control. So this is a control. Theme override is here. Fonts is here. And load. Fonts. Zolonium or something. And then what was the size? 64. 64. We look at this in the scene. Save. What does it look like? Yes, that's pretty big. Cool. Same thing with this guy. Theme overrides. Fonts. Load. I'm going to try quick load. 64. Um, this is not a font. Okay. What about the button? I need to anchor them. Arrange the nodes as shown below. You can drag the nodes and place them. Was I supposed to put a label? Where do they say to name this Dodge the Creeps? They didn't, it's right here. Okay. Arrange the nodes as shown below. You can drag the nodes to place them manually or for more precise, use anchor presets. So what is the anchor preset? Top, middle, 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 and then somewhere below that. Don't know how you get the start location. Okay. This is top middle. What looks like a preset. This thing? Yes. So top middle. That guy? Does that look right? It does look right, but didn't really move. Vertical alignment, horizontal alignment. Mm, that's not actually doing anything as far as I can tell. I have to type something. Oh, it definitely did something. All right, let's move it. Why is this so gigantic? That cannot be right. HUD. 64. Oh. oh, that's the wrong one. Maybe I'll put an extra character in this one. Font size, no, 64. Okay. Was it destroy all creeps or something? Is this, is it just me or is this gigantic? Oh, it's not gigantic. Okay, there's the outline. I think I'm gonna make that blue line like bigger or something. All right. This one was in the middle. It also didn't move. Why are you not anchoring? Is it this thing? Ah. Anchor. Nope. <laughs> it looks like an anchor. When active, move control nodes changes their anchors instead of their offsets. Maybe we should have did that. It's not very clear. Nodes have a position and a size, but they also have anchors. Anchors define the origin, the reference point for the edge of the node. Arrange the nodes as shown below. You can drag the nodes to place them manually, or for more precise placement, use anchor presets. Ah, that's a different icon. Yeah, blue line is ridiculous. This icon. Oh, okay, middle. And how do I make this text wrap? Auto wrap. Word smart. See, I don't think it knows the bounds of the room. Maybe it does. Dodge the creeps. What's that stupid window? Okay. Dodge the creeps. 
Was it three lines? Probably it was just three lines, right? No, two lines. Dodge the creeps. Why is it so large? This one's like centered. I really just put spaces here. Like that. Seems like that's what they did. Okay. And the button, I have no idea how I'm going to place it other than manually drag it. I guess this probably does have a font. Buttons can have font too, okay? Don't judge. 64. How do I undo that? I think I moved something. This thing. What is that? Okay, there it goes. I'm just going to manually move it up a little. Or maybe, maybe it should be in the middle and then offset down. I'm assuming this is the offset. Uh, something like that. That's a big button. All right, add the text zero, set the horizontal alignment of vertical center, choose anchor, re, uh, preset center top message, dodge the creep, set the horizontal alignment and vertical alignment to center. Uh, that's probably how they did it then. Center. Center. Let's see, do they have some kind of auto wrap? Um, yeah, auto wrap mode to word. There it goes. That's much better. Under control layout, transform set size X to 480 to use the entire width of the screen. I was wondering how they got the width, so you just set it. Under layout, transform, layout, transform, layout, transform, width, should be size should be 480x size 480. Cool. Let me recenter that. There we go. Uh, choose anchor so center. Add the text start under control layout transfer set x to 200 and y to 100. Okay. And to change that layout. Transform. That was close. 177. 100. Choose the anchor center bottom. Yeah. That's my first choice. Messed it up though. All right. Under control layout, I set Y position of 580. 80. On the message timer, set the wait time to two and set the one shot to on. Two, one shot. Okay, now add the script. So we need a start game. Add scripts. So we got a new signal there. We now want to display a message temporarily, such as get ready. So we add the following code, show message text, message.text equals text, message show. Okay. Start the timer. We also need to process what happens when the player loses. The code below will show game over for two seconds, then return the title, right? Return the title screen. And after a brief pause, show the start button. Cool. Show message game over. So it calls this function game over. And it sets the timeout, so it waits for the timeout. 
then it changes the text to dodge the creeps. It shows that. Why didn't it say message.show game over? Because it timed out. It has to restart it, maybe. Make a one shot timer and wait for it to finish. Get tree, create timer, 1.0 timeout, then show the button. So that's like an inline timer. Interesting. Uh, this function is called when the player loses. It will show game over for two seconds, then return to the timer. Yeah, we're about that. Uh, when you need to pause for a brief time, an alternative to using a timer node is to use the scenes trees create timer function. This can be very useful and add delays such as the above code, where we want to wait some time before showing the start button. Add the code below to HUD to update the score. So when do we update the score? Oh, when time passes, right? Update score. The question is, when does this get called? On start, hide the start button. Say that the start is admit, or admit that the start game has happened. And then when the on message timer times out, hide the message. Okay. So, still nothing calling update score. Connecting HUD to main. Now that we're done creating HUD scene, go back to main instance of HUD scene and main. Like a different player scene, the scene tree should look like this. So make sure you didn't miss anything. So I gotta add HUD. Okay, save this guy. Go back to main. Add. How did I do it? I did the link. HUD. Okay. Scene should look like this. HUD. Now we need to connect the HUD function to our main script. This requires a few additions of the main scene. In the node tab, connect HUD start game signal to the new game function. I knew there was a start game somewhere in there. <laughs> All right. Uh, a function of the main node by clicking pick button in the connect to signal window and select new game. Connect HUD start game. New game method of type new game below receiver method. In the window, verify that the screen green connection icon now appears next to funk new game in the script. All right, start game to new game. So node. Uh, bu 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 start game. Do I have to click on this guy? Start game. And the receiver should be on HUD start game. Pick new game. Let's see if I did that right. On mob timeout, on start time, on start time, on game, on player, on process, on. I think I did it backwards. HUD dot update score in new game update the score display and show get ready. Verify that the green connection icon now appears next to the funk new game in the script. New game, new game, new game, new game, new game. Here's the new game. And it is hooked up. Okay. Hooked up to the hut. Okay. I think that's right. Find out soon enough. In new game, update the score display and show the get ready message. So how do I have access to HUD? Oh, because yeah, it's on the same. It's in the main scene. Update the score. And the score is starts out at zero. Show the message. Okay, and then when we update the score. Oh, then show the game over and game over. That makes sense. Uh, we get game over when we die. Uh, new game process on player hit. Game over. Game over. Okay. Finally, add the on score timer timeout to keep the display in sync with the changing score. 
on score timer time out on start on score okay so we are updating one every timer time out and then update the hud makes sense to me remember to remove all remove the call to new game from ready if you haven't already oh good call you go away now you're ready to play click the play play the project button you'll be asked to select me and see you already did that expected indented block yeah this guy I just wonder if it's gonna call me out on that Hey, you are indebted. Uh, pass. All right. Moment of truth. So. Zero. Destroy the creeps. Start. And then two seconds later. Ah, oh, it didn't work. Start. Start. Okay, so I must have wired this up wrong. So this is on new game. Start timer. Oh, go to this guy. Timer dot start. Score timer start. Start timer timeouts. Where's the on timer timeouts? I do the wrong one. On start timer timeout. Yeah, you click start button. Maybe the click start button is wrong. Where's the start button? Start button to HUD. Yeah, where does start button do anything? Must have missed that. Pressed. Yeah, one that we didn't hook up start button. Hmm. Where do we miss that? Start button. Start game. Show message. message. Update score. On start button pressed. How do they keep missing these sections? All right, connect the press signal of start button on the timeout signal of message timer and add this the following code to the new functions. So start buttons pressed on the timeout. These signals are seems they seem so backwards to me. Okay, but on start button pressed, you call start button hide, start game emit. Cool. So wherever they we have a start game signal, we want this function. Let's do that. Start game, it's right there. So let's add this. Oops. So on start button pressed, start game emit. Doesn't like it. Do we already have that? We already have that. Ooh, so we did add that. Okay. We did add that. So then what went wrong? Well, let's do a log. What do I always say? When in doubt, log it. Okay. And then the timer we care about is actually start timer on start timer. On start uh, underscores. Oh, that's player. Oh, main. On start timer timeout. It's just acting like I didn't press it at all. 
So it's not hooked up somehow. Okay, let's see. How do you hook this up if it, that's not it? On start button pressed. On start button pressed. Start button. On. So here's pressed. Base button. HUD. On start button pressed. I already have. But now it's connected. See, it wasn't connected before. It's so weird. I don't, these are magical signal connector things I just don't get. All right, and then the other one is on message timer. Timeout. Uh, message timer, this guy. <laughs> Magically connect, there it goes. Okay, there's some magic in that. I guess I gotta go through those steps. There we are. One, two, three. Game over. God, the creeps. Is this supposed to clear the enemies? I kind of like that it doesn't. Let's see how many, what my high score could be. Whoa. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you need to connect stuff. I thought it was name like function based, but it's not. There's something in the background that's wiring these things up. I bet if we were using C sharp, it'd be more explicit, but there's some auto magicalness happening with GD script and Godot. Oh my gosh. That was a lot longer than I thought it would. Well, I kind of knew it might take a while, but we did it. I feel like just these tools, just a little bit I learned about animation, the movement, collision. Like, I'm going to use like all of that in the game I'm trying to make. So pretty, pretty happy with this tutorial. Very, very cool. All right. Oh, removing old creeps was supposed to do something. Do we just not get to that part? Yeah, we didn't get to that part. Okay. I kind of like that the creeps keep floating around. I'm glad I had someone to watch, man, and chat with me. That was really cool. Appreciate that. I'm going to do more of these. Uh, not Maybe not always game development. Some just AI coding, some app coding. But definitely want to get farther on this game that I'm trying to build. Moving old creeps. Okay, if you play into a game over and then start a new game right away, the creeps from the previous game may still be on the screen. It would be better if they all disappear at the start. Oh, okay, start of new game, I agree. Not at the end. I like them floating around. We just need a way to tell all the mobs remove themselves. We can do this with a group feature. In the mob scene, select the root node and click node tab next to the inspector. The same place where you find node signals next to signals click groups groups and you can type a new group name and click add now all mobs that will be in the mobs group will be in the mobs group we can then add the following line to the new game function get tree call all group that's cool q free the call group function calls the named function on every node in a group in this case, we are telling every mob to delete itself. The game's mostly done at this point. In the next and last part, we'll polish it a bit by adding a background. Oh, I need to figure out how to do that. Looping music and keyboard shortcuts. Okay, that's crazy. More, but now I gotta finish it, so I'm gonna finish it. We get rid of this log. In mob. So that's what that Q free thing was doing. Q free Q's a node for deletion. Cool. Um, on the mob groups, mobs or mob? Probably the plural, right? Mobs. Cool. Then in new game, you do this guy. 
makes sense. In new game. New game. Game over. New game. New game. Sky. A tree. Call a group. Mobs. And call it Q free function. Let's try it out real quick. Okay, let's die as soon as possible. Boom. Oh, I didn't delete them. Why not? It's also possible that it takes a second to delete them. Mm -hmm. We can increase the timeout to to really verify this, but yeah, look like it didn't work. Did I hit add? I bet I have to hit add here. Yep. Oh, well, this is something simple. Die fast, die fast, die. Oh, we got a crash. Uh, attempt to call function update score in base null instance on null on null instance. Uh, HUD. So you're saying there is no HUD. Of it to be no. Uh, oh, did I put mobs? I must have put mobs as the group name of Hut. <laughs> oh, I'm so tired. All right, cool. The group name of mob is mobs. Deleted my whole hub. Imagine if I didn't know how to troubleshoot dumb mistakes. Searching for hours for that. Like, why is it deleting? Why is my hub gone? There's a hub right there. There's a hub. Hey, it worked. Cool. Finishing up. If you have now completed all the functionality for our game, below are some remaining steps to add a bit more juice to improve the game experience. Feel free to expand the gameplay with your own ideas. Background. The default gray background is not very appealing, so let's change its color. One way to do this is to use a color rected node. Make it the first node under main so that we it will be drawn behind the other nodes. Color rect only has one property. Okay, so the order of nodes matters. Good to know. Choose a color you like and select layout, anchors preset, full rect, either in the toolbar at the top of the viewport or in the inspector so that it covers the scene. You could also add a background image if you have one by using text direct. Okay, we'll use the color rect. What's it called? Pretty. Doesn't really say, but I'll probably just call it background. Okay, add the color right to the top. Call it background. Uh, pick a color. We'll go with space gray. Blackish. And then full rect. Where was that? It's, there was a preset for it, but where? Full screen. Layout, choose color you like, layout, anchor preset, full rec, layout, anchor preset, full rec, there it is. Cool. Do -do -do. Okay. 
Sound effects, sound and music can be the single most effective way to add appeal to the game experience. In your game's art folder, you have two sound files, house in a forest loop, .org for the background music and game over dot wave for when the player loses. Add two audio stream player nodes as children of Maine. Name one of the music and the other death sound. <laughs> nice. On each one, click the stream property, select load and choose the corresponding audio. So audio stream player, uh, music, death sound, music, death sound, music, death sound. Music. Green player 2D, I guess. And do we need to choose stream? New audio stream? No. Load. Game over. Guy becomes music. Sky, death sound, death sound. Okay, is there more to it? On each one, click stream property select load. I thought it said loop. All audio is automatically imported with the loop setting disabled. If you want the music to loop seamlessly, click on the stream file arrow, select make unique, and then click on the stream file and check the loop box. Make unique. Make unique. Why do I have to make it unique? Oh, so it doesn't like spawn it. Stream, autoplay, probably want autoplay. Yeah, oh, maybe not. Um, where's the loop? Where's the loop? There it is. Loop on. Okay. To play the music, uh, add music.play in the new game function. Music stop and game over. Music don't play. Game over. Game over, man. Game over. Death sound don't play. And um, music. I stop. Hey. A little quiet on that death sound. <laughs> do, 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 do. Love it. Awesome. Music stop. That's how I'm playing. Yep. Keyboard shortcut. Since the game is played with keyboard controls, it would be convenient if you could also start the game by pressing a key on the keyboard. We can do this with the shortcut property of the button node. In a previous lesson, we created four input actions to move the character. We will create a similar input action to map the, to the start button. Uh, select project, project settings, and then click on the input map tab in the same way you created the movement input actions. Create a new input action called start game and add a key map to the enter key. Project settings. Enter. Yeah, how did I do that? I just say start game and map it like that. Oops. Enter. Now would be a good time to add controller support if you have one available.
Attach or pair your controller, and then under each input action that you wish to add controls aboard for, click the plus I, uh, plus button to press the corresponding button D-pad and stick direction that you want to map to the respective input action. In the HUD scene, select Start button and find the shortcut property in the inspector. Create a new shortcut resource by clicking within the box. Open the events array and add a new array element to it by clicking on the array input size zero. Create a new input event action and name it Start Game. Input event action. Uh, shortcuts. Empty. New shortcut. Input array. Add elements. Uh, new input event or new input event key. New inputs. I already forgot. Inputs, input, input, input. One. And then it should be input, new input event key. Is that what it's called? Input event key. And this just says inputs. New input event action. Yeah, input event action. There we go. Action. Start game. On one. Nice. Okay. Now when the start game appears, you can either click it or press enter to start the game. With that, you can play your first 2D game and go. Okay. Enter key. Ready? Ah! Game over. Game over. Do, 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 do. Love it. All right. Thanks everyone for watching. That was a really good stream. It was a really, really good uh, chat today. Thank you guys. Shout out to uh, Murdered with threes instead of E's. Red Dragon 72Q. We appreciate you guys jumping in. And to the rest of you watching on YouTube, watching the VOD, thanks for watching. Till next time.